morning, everyone. My name is Cheryl Finley, and it's my great pleasure to introduce you to the second distinguished lecture of the year with Franklin Sermons, director of the Perez Art Museum, Miami. I'm the director of the Atlanta University Center Art History and Curatorial Studies Collective. And together with the team of the AUC Art Collective, Rachel Brown, and Lauren Harris, and with the faculty of the Department of Art and Visual Culture, the chair of the Department of Art and Visual Culture, Myra Green, the division chair of the arts, Ayoka Chinzera, and President Mary Schmidt Campbell, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. Housed within the Department of Art and Visual Culture at Spelman College, the Atlanta University Center Art History and Curatorial Studies Collective is an innovative program that aims to shape the future of the art world and position the Atlanta University Center as the leading incubator of African-American professionals in these fields of museum studies, art history, and curatorial studies. We are cultivating students who seek knowledge, discover purpose, and make change. Made possible by the generous support of the Alice L. Walton Foundation, undergraduate students enrolled in this program are also eligible for scholarships and paid summer internship opportunities. And students are enrolled from Spelman College, Clark Atlanta University, and Morehouse College. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Franklin Sermons, the director of the Perez Art Museum, Miami. He has been the director of PAM since 2015. And since coming to PAM, he has overseen the acquisition of more than a thousand works of art by donation or purchase. At PAM, Sermons has pursued his vision by strengthening existing affiliate groups such as PAM's Fund for African-American Art and also the International Women's Committee. And also he has created the Latin American and Latinx Art Fund. He envisions PAM and has envisioned PAM over the last five years as the People's Museum, doing a lot of the work in and around Miami and existing communities to bring in more people into the museum. Sermons has organized exhibitions such as Toba Kedori in 2017, and he was also the co-curator of the World's Game, Football and Contemporary Art in 2018. Prior to his appointment at PAM, he was the department head and curator of contemporary art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art from 2010 to 2015. And there he curated Noah Purifoy, Junk Dada, also variations, conversations in and around abstract painting, and also ends and exits contemporary art from the collections of LACMA and the Broad Foundation. From 2006 to 2010, Sermons was curator of modern and contemporary art at the Menil Collection in Houston, where he organized several exhibitions, including one of my favorites, Neo Hoodoo, Art for a Forgotten Faith. Mr. Sermons is also the recipient of the David C. Driscoll Prize in, in 2007, which is administered by the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. Now, uh, before I turn the, the, the mic over to Mr. Sermons this evening, I just wanted to read from an excerpt um, uh, that was written by Cynthia Rockwell uh, some time ago about um, or organic uh, entryways into art. And she was interviewing Mr. Sermons at this time and she asked the question, what drew you into the art world? And his answer was, I'll never forget the day I walked into an African-American literature class taught by Bob O'Mealy at Wesleyan University. At the time, Mr. O'Mealy was a professor of English um, and also affiliated with the Center for African-American Studies there. He had a boom box playing and he integrated sound and music into the discussions of incidents of a life of a slave girl. I had never seen a combination like that. It touched me in a very deep way, he said. And it's part of why I became an English and art history major. And I want to underscore this for the many students who might be here uh, with us this evening to think about the interdisciplinary nature 
of the field of art history and also of curatorial studies. And I think Mr. Sermons is a leading example um, for our stu students, especially as we learn today at a really lovely um, and intimate lunch with him uh, at the midday. And I wanna conclude by saying, uh, again, reading from this interview with Mr. Sermons, um, and I'll quote him here. He says, curating requires a similar marriage of writing and art. He says, I did my thesis on Jean-Michel Basquiat with Professor Peter Mark. So my curating began with putting a few artists together in one piece of writing. And with that, um, it's my great pleasure to uh, again, turn the mic over to Franklin Sermons and to welcome you, Franklin, to our Distinguished Lecture Series this evening. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, thanks to everybody at the AUCR Collective. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you. I only wish we were in person, but we all do at this point. Um, I'm going to turn, I'm gonna share a screen in a minute, but I uh, just wanted to say that, um, in addition to my thanks, it, it's, you know, when Cheryl calls and, and asks you to do something, you say yes. And I figure oh, I'm gonna be uh, engaged in conversation with Cheryl, so you know it's gonna be a good time. But what I've done is tried to put together a, a kind of compendium of, of images that touch on um, some of the things she mentioned. And it also reminds me that, you know, yeah, we do things as individuals, but we really do things uh, collectively. And none of those exhibitions, of course, happen without uh, a host of people behind them. Um, I also have to uh, acknowledge um, Rachel and Lauren and Dr. Campbell. And it, it's just, it's great to be with you guys. And um, again, thinking about Atlanta, thinking about being there, one of my last trips, if not my last trip in January was to Atlanta uh, to be there during the AAMD meeting at the end of last January and got to spend some time in the Spelman Gallery. Um, I also, I don't know, it didn't come up uh, this afternoon, but it was so, so much fun to be engaged with the students uh, this afternoon. It reminds me about, about doing these kind of things in person too also reminds me that I was on that campus 31 years ago um, doing a spring semester at Morehouse. So shout out to Morehouse. Um, took a photography class at, at Clark Atlanta and also studied with um, the great, great, great poet Mari Evans at Spelman. So the, you know, those are the kind of things that are in the back of my mind when I think of um, being engaged with you this evening. Uh, I'll share a screen. Okay. Um, everybody can see that. We sure miss call and response here, but I'm going to assume that everybody can see that. Um, we can see it. Cool. Uh, so this is obviously a picture of the Perez from um, the water. And I think that this is the kind of future um, entry point in some ways, right? Um, I hate to say it, but I was on, uh, I was in my car last night during a incredible um, storm and you could see how water was piling up on certain um, residences and, and businesses. And it just makes you think that, uh, is Venice in our future uh, in Miami or, or do we change uh, the world and acknowledge uh, climate change? Um, I'm gonna go back to go forward. And this is more relevant to what we were talking about today as a, a point of entry. Um, point of entry for me, I, I call it a, a cliche type of moment, but in 1985, seeing this um, image of the New York Times Magazine of Jean-Michel Basquiat uh, on the cover and never forgetting that um, coming from a background and, and being uh, exposed to a lot of artists, particularly those who were working in an abstract vein at that time and then seeing Basquiat and the relationship to a, a more contemporary moment or a relationship to text and a relationship to the kind of intertextual nature 
of music, of fashion, of that kind of creativity all coming together was something that propelled me um, to this moment. And maybe we can get to that. Um, I, I also, uh, I'll begin here with One Planet Under a Groove, um, hip hop and contemporary art, because this exhibition um, also traveled uh, to Spellman and was there in 2003. And I can, I mean, this is probably the first institutional exhibition I worked on. And as somebody who did their thesis on Jean-Michel Basquiat, you'll see that it makes perfect sense, right? So you see a uh, painting by him on the left and then the cover of our book with uh, an incredible work by the great David Hammonds called In the Hood, um, literally uh, a hood that is affixed to uh, the wall, you know, you you miss that kind of context with the cover of the book, but um, that is the conceptual nature of the piece. Um, so that was 2001, and and again, I'm just going to go through some of these briefly for the sake of background, and we get to um, talk about uh, Miami and talk about what we're doing in the here and now. Um, I would say that so much of what I uh, was interested in after doing that thesis on Basquiat and thinking about that moment and, and what could one say as far as a curatorial vice, voice within that moment was largely gauged around a conversation with not only Basquiat but hip hop as a concept and as a thematic kind of thrust in several exhibitions, including this one, New Wave, which takes its title directly from a 1981 exhibition at PS1 in New York. Um, so yes. And then jumping forward to uh, 2005 Brooklyn Museum, um, being able to work on that exhibition um, with Kelly Jones and most especially uh, was, was kind of the culmination in some ways of a lot of my interest in the artist. It's a strand that runs through at least five or six different exhibitions. So I, I have to um, jump to that and, and just look through um, that lens to some degree because it has so profoundly uh, affected my uh, curatorial interest. Um, 2006, you mentioned the beautiful game and, and of course um, collaboration at the heart of all of these shows, but uh, this exhibition co-organized with my dear friend, Trevor Schoonmaker. It was one of the first times um, we were looking at this subject and have explored it um, since then in other ways. And I can show a couple of images of that, but I also show that here just to provide the context of you know, the interest in popular culture as a way of working through exhibitions or thinking through ideas and that being a sort of um, thrust that continues to ground um, the interest that I have working in the museum space. Um, this exhibition featured 30 some odd artists from around the world and, and was, was created on the occasion of the World Cup. So we were showing the work at Robin Hall and then showing the uh, games that were going on um, that year uh, at the same time. So this idea of real life playing a part in the exhibition space was always important and integral. Um, and then, you know, kind of like uh, going back into the institution. So I, I, I skim over it here, um, but starting at the Manila Collection, uh, as mentioned in 2006, um, was a sort of pivotal, I guess, point in terms of being in a museum space as a curator. And prior to that, it was uh, for me only as an independent curator or as a publications assistant at DS Center for the Arts. But from 2006 to 2010, got to work with some amazing people at the Manila Collection. Um, a place that was also connected to Dia Center for the Arts by family. And let me see the building there. Um, and then Neohudu, uh, as Cheryl mentioned. Um, Neohudu Art for a Forgotten Faith is an exhibition that uh, was conceived of, of in New York around the same time um, as that exhibition, The Beautiful Game. And in that moment, I think, trying to think of ways in which, okay, you can talk through sport, you can talk through music, and how does one speak through spirituality? 
Um, it's it's kind of weird to think of now, but I think in hindsight, you know, the, there was a, a period post 911 that was driven by a form of, of introspection, at least for me and, and in many um, conversations with colleagues, um, that was really driven by, by a, a desire to look um, on a more existential kind of existence. Um, Neil Hudu also grew out of a desire to speak from a very, very specific space. Um, Art for a Forgotten Faith, the subtitle comes directly from the author Ishmael Reed and the title Neahudu, um, which I uh, selected is based off of his writing. And kind of um, how does one address spirituality in the space of the Americas? And I think, you know, the, the idea of thinking through um, this place that is unique in its nexus point of European colonization, religion uh, as, a, as, as a basis of manifest destiny mixed with slavery and African um, history and specifically uh, West African uh, spirituality that is, is, is easily um, traceable uh, to a Yoruba tradition. Um, and others, and to think through that as being a characteristic of American art as a whole. So giving myself some kind of rules, some sort of parameters, and saying that all of the artists in the exhibition must be from the Americas. Um, you know, I think in some ways in, in inspired by someone like Constantine Brancusi, who also made a lot of work about spirituality, but uh, not wanting to go in into opening up, up to that kind of uh, a reading, um, keeping things in the Americas. This is a work, uh, Halo by James Lee Byers, and that was in the collection of the Manila collection. Um, reminds me of the transitional phase between working independently and working in the institution. This exhibition started as an idea while working on a curatorial team at PS1 that um, was predominantly made up of contemporary artists. Um, artists who were living in that moment and dealing with that moment, but then going to Houston and, and having the opportunity to think in a little bit more of an expansive way through modernism uh, was something that, that, that I embraced uh, wholeheartedly for this show. A um, couple of images, and, and that gives you a taste of, of the contemporary aspect of it. That's Gary Simmons on the top, um, Robert Gober, and foreground and Felix Gonzalez Torres in the background. And I should also say that, so the, 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 the book is mumbo jumbo. Um, and in mumbo jumbo, you have a storyline running through it that is similar to the storyline of, of, of artifacts that need to be rescued in, in the film Black Panther. Um, in that book, he, the, there is a description of, of a group who is trying to rescue the artifacts and, and those being native, those being African, um, those being Asian and rescuing them from the house of art detention, right? And the house of art detention is this place that in many ways, I think I, I grew up with as a museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, is the, the, what he's talking about and where he's talking about of just the way that um, this place takes over uh, the artifacts and the reception of those artifacts and they need to be rescued. And in part, that is what uh, part of the thesis around the exhibition uh, was itself. Um, the Simmons bottles are, are very specifically about that transference of West African traditions in the new world, the bottle tree. Um, Gober a little bit more obliquely dealing with uh, America and colonialism. Um, Felix Gonzalez Torres taking us into a more kind of a space of spirituality where one potentially loses oneself. And for me at that time, that has a resonance with uh, a dance floor. Um, um, like you see other images um, here from that exhibition um, in the foreground, Jose Badia, a Miami artist. And, and I should say that this exhibition also went to Miami um, and had to, right? It's an exhibition dealing with spirituality in the Americas, thus dealing with Vaudun from Haiti, dealing with Condomble from Brazil, dealing with 
Santeria from the Cuban tradition. And Media certainly touches on that in the foreground piece. An incredible Basquiat that um, uh, obviously is another one of those markers throughout uh, these early exhibitions. And, and then a Sanford Biggers um, sort of uh, tribal object, if you will, that has been cut in half and placed one at customary museum viewing height and the other uh, at a different level, you know, to question the idea of what are museums um, for, what, what is contained within them. And this goes especially resonant within the moment as we talk about objects um, being returned, um, particularly a couple of, of recent and interesting um, incidents at the Musée Coin Brownlee in, in Paris, among other places, but where we are talking about retribution of objects to Africa specifically. Um, Basquiat on the Bayou, as I mentioned, I, I, can't, I can't think through the trajectory of, of exhibitions without thinking through Basquiat. And so having the opportunity to work on Prospect in 2014 or, or the, the couple of years before that um, made me uh, consider how Basquiat's work is, of course, at the crooks also of, of that exhibition. And so much so that we ended up doing a singular exhibition with a singular book devoted completely to that show. Um, another exhibition from Houston, and I'm gonna, I, I, as I may not have mentioned, um, uh, I got, got into an academic frame of mind and have included uh, about who knows how many slides. So we're gonna go through some of them a little bit quicker. Um, here, Odebanga Jones and Associates uh, from a uh, kind of conceptual take on their part in which we turned the gallery of the museum space into a classroom. And they would come in and do um, teachings, particularly as it related to Black history. Uh, Robert Ryman, also um, from uh, the Manil Collection, uh, Maurizio Catalan, Thea Selmans. And this is an exhibition that, that actually uh, I took with me from its initial installation in Houston to its uh, place in Los Angeles at LACMA, which is where, of course, a show of the Elements um, would need to be. Um, you see one of the works there. Uh, she's very much known within the tradition of artists from LA. And, and a group exhibition that was a collaboration with Christine Kim, um, the great Carrie Marshall, uh, at the center there is a piece that has been in that collection for many years. Uh, Larry Pittman on the left and Ayinka Shonabari photograph in the back. Um, and another, just an image from an exhibition there with Barbara Kruger, Katie Noland. Um, uh, an another angle of the same room with, with dear Lorraine O'Grady's uh, wonderful uh, costume of, of um, uh, on the mannequin, uh, a Lorna Simpson photograph to the left, um, and then an exhibition that also was at LACMA, um, Football the Beautiful Game, which is another iteration, uh, the second of three uh, for me thus far in terms of every four years one must deal with, with football and the many metaphorical possibilities that it allows for us to consider uh, with art. Um, Noah Purifoy, uh, we uh, um, mentioned that and very much a Los Angeles show, a show that grew out of uh, the studies from Pacific Standard Time, a large exhibition that was supported by the Getty Foundation, I think it was back in 2012. Um, Purifoy, an artist who lived in Los Angeles, who was a co-founder of the Watts Towers Art Center, who then left to go out to the desert um, in Joshua Tree and kind of needed to, to get away, to remove himself as an artist from um, contemporary life in many ways and the vagaries of it. Um, just to give you a little taste. And, and, and then I would come forward. Um, so just including a uh, mission and vision of, of, of us here uh, at the Perez Art Museum Miami right now. And if you talk about that, but I begin to, 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 to talk about it from, from this point of view and from this moment, because this is the foundational years in which the museum comes to life, um, the early 1980s in Miami and in particular, you know, we had a founding director, Jan Vandermark, uh, who 
had spent time at Midwest institutions like the MCA Chicago, the Detroit Institute of the Arts, and came to Miami, I think very much as a foreigner, but one who was particularly attuned and keen on what was happening um, in that moment uh, with immigration, with uh, immigration that was on, on some levels, you know, people not always being accepted the same way, um, Cuban immigration, Haitian immigration being treated very differently in this city. Uh, the, the violence of those years um, because of a major drug trade in those years and the developing of, of a city that was in constant, constant change. And Joan Didion picks up on that in that quote. Um, time saw, saw things in a, in a kind of blanket way uh, in calling it uh, Paradise Lost. And, and, and then I jumped to um, Surrounded Islands uh, by, by Christo and Jean-Claude. And I think this is, you know, Jan Vandermark had worked with the artists in Chicago in 1969, was probably the first big project they did in the United States. And when he saw the territory of Miami in that moment, I believe that what he saw was a, a place that not only needed um, art in a, in a kind of museological sense, but art in a much more physical, um, interactive and community-centered approach. Right? So this project involved 4,000 some odd people um, literally putting together work that would go into the water uh, by surrounding these 11 islands of Biscayne Bay. And this, we are as an institution located right on Biscayne Bay. Um, we did not begin there, of course. Um, I'll show you uh, a couple of images from where we began. Um, a couple other views, Christophe Jean-Claude. And, and the, 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 the idea of community, the idea of people working together was something that was a driving force for this exhibition. And it, importantly, this exhibition happens in May of 1983, and then Vandermark opens the museum in January of 1984. Uh, of course, this is, this is that moment that many of us know through uh, Miami Vice. Um, and I'm just gonna play it quick little clip. I think we have, Rachel, you got. Crime in Miami is up and tourism is down. When tourism is down, so is South Florida's economy. The city looks peaceful and prosperous from here. A new luxury hotel over there at Brickell Point, construction cranes on the skyline over there at Ball Point. But tourism officials are deeply worried, and they held an emergency meeting this morning to try to map plans to revive the flagging tourism business. They want to make Miami paradise regained, as opposed to what Time Magazine this week calls paradise lost. Miami in 1980 and 81 was a rough and tumble place, kind of raw around the edges, but so exciting, a city that was kind of fighting its identity, fighting crime, trying to assimilate 125,000 Cubans. There had been the Mario boat lift. This was in the Miami that I grew up in Puerto Rico thinking of the, 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 the Miami of Frank Sinatra, uh, Morris Lapidus, the Fontainebleau Hilton, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., Bonnie Yeager. I arrived to a uh, Miami that have sort of like forgotten its past. And suddenly this artist and his wife, I mean, this couple came along and said, hey, we want to put some pink cloth around the islands in Biscayne Bay. And people generally said, what? For what reason? And we became like giant flowers. You get it. Thank you. Uh, let me bring that back. Okay. Uh, so just to, to give you a little bit more um, context around that, uh, obviously, um, to hear the moment from the moment is, is quite compelling. It gives a, a broad view of, of the kind of beginnings of the museum. So opening January, 1984, um, directly across from the government center. So very much seen as a civic uh, endeavor and effort. Uh, that is the original museum, which was first called the Center for Fine Arts, obviously. Uh, 10 years later would become a collecting institution in 1994 and become the Miami Art Museum. Um, what a time to start collecting 
and we'll get to some of that. Um, but the first show that Vandermark thought was, was, was appropriate for the opening of this museum in this place that did not have collections uh, that, that you know of now um, and was this idea of trying to put, he tried to put everything into the first exhibition. So this show in Quest of Excellence was the first show and it included things like a French parade helmet um, and, and things that were borrowed from many, many museums around the country, including the Low Art Museum, which had already existed here in Miami. Um, uh, let me spin through some of these. Uh, Morris Lewis, which, which becomes a sort of cornerstone of the collection at a very early point. Um, and these are just some of the earlier uh, shows. Um, and, and you see that there's, there's really, there's no necessarily, a, not necessarily a focal point, um, they're kind of all over the place. Um, at that time in Miami, I think in some ways the backdrop is a sense of the public nature of art, a sense of things being monumental, not unlike the Christo and Jean-Claude project. So we have this amazing uh, Klaus Oldenburg and Klaus von Bruggen, uh, orange bowl scattered slices that sits directly in front of the government center right now would have been directly across the street from the museum. We have Ed Boucher's first really large public installation, a series of 30 some odd paintings that ring the, the, the library. This is the public library. Um, and Miami is, 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 is different at this time. And I think part of uh, what goes into making the uh, collection unique in this moment is, is the relationship to acknowledging Miami as a very specific place. And that's what we've tried to really pick up on. Um, this painting by Amelia Playa, this great painting by Amelia Playa, the Cuban uh, artist uh, is here and also seen with an article from uh, the New York Times from 1988, um, in which you know we talk about um, museums right now, and there is a lot to talk about and a lot going on. Um, th th it was a very, very uh, sensitive um, space in the context of Miami at that time, especially for someone like Ramon Cernuda, who was uh, part of the Cuban Museum of Art and Culture in Miami and, and interested in showing artists from the island from Cuba. And we, to, to be um, frank, uh, that, that was not, that was seen as propping up uh, the, the regime. Um, so there was actually a pipe bomb at, at that museum in this moment. Um, we move forward and I'm gonna try and just give us some context around when we begin a sort of new phase with Suzanne Delahanty and after becoming a collecting uh, institution um, Suzanne picked up on, 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 I think, a lot of things that we also try to, uh, I, I like to say, double down on right now, and that's our relationship, again, to where we are very specifically. Um, what I say is, you know, we're a museum of modern and contemporary art at this point. That focus came into play, um, but how we address that is we address that by, by at least trying to be the best at presenting the work of Latin America and the Caribbean while we look toward uh, the African diaspora and toward the US Latino experience. Um, so the, just the, the inclusion of the map and this great, great, great show with this incredible catalog uh, that came from UCLA um, was one of the earliest uh, exhibitions uh, at, the, at the museum after becoming a Miami Art Museum. Uh, just an installation view. Um, another important point of departure for us in that moment are, is global conceptualism and, and being part of a conversation that although conceptualist in nature was very much about uh, sort of naming a space for Miami within a, a larger conversation, not doing what the average American museum might do, um, but, but thinking in, in a way that uh, was, I think, in line with the way that we talk about the city now as being a part of the Caribbean, as being part of Latin America. And so we tried to work from that space, um, most especially. Um, so just uh, running through a few photographs here from a large gift from Charles Cole's collection, which is integral to uh, our museum right now. I'm very happy that uh, our Ford Fellow Ade Omotosho recently did an exhibition exclusively of photography. Um, 
at the museum last year or two years ago now, everything was last year. Uh, and then we revisited the, the same theme through photography from the collection earlier. Um, um, what I uh, also find uh, so interesting about the collection is that while the first piece that is acquired is a work by Al Held, which is actually up in the museum right now, but the first piece that was actually bought by the museum is this wonderful Lorna Simpson photograph on felt um, from, from Brooklyn, actually from the park in Brooklyn, from Prospect Park. Um, Alfredo Jarre, obviously very important to the way that we see the Americas. This is a piece that was also a big uh, part of a touchstone for the Nihudu show. Uh, Anna Mendieta, um, this work is up right now, absolutely crucial to uh, our discussion of um, not only Cuban artists in that context, but of performing bodies and particularly women's bodies. So this is in an exhibition right now called My Body, My Rules, which was just opened in, a month ago. Um, Jose Bedia, again, a very different type of piece than the sculptural work that was in Neohudu, but something he's quite well known for as a painter. And Neohudu from that, and of course, um, this is a, a Killmonger um, trying to ret retrieve the artifacts in Black Panther. Uh, another image from Neohudu, Neohudu, Neohudu. And then let's see if we can move through some of these. Um, you know, the idea of, of having a museum space that was equal to the uh, desires and I think dreams of, of our founders uh, was that it was time to move from a much smaller space um, in downtown to, to a, a grander building. And so Herzog and de Meuron um, was, was, are the architects for the building and worked very closely with another director, Terry Riley, who of course is an architect in his own right and had been the head of the architecture department at MoMA. But he was, the, I guess, the ideal director for this moment in which the museum goes from a, a smaller space and, and grows into a much larger space. This is a 200,000 square foot um, camp, well, not campus, but 200,000 square feet that we're dealing with, 120,000 square feet indoors, 80,000 surrounding it. And we share this campus now. Um, another view uh, of that. Um, the, the hanging gardens, which are incredibly difficult and challenging to keep looking fresh at all times, um, but, but it is a hallmark of the building, obviously. Um, our auditorium, which is based straight up in the middle of the galleries, um, permanent collection galleries and temporary uh, collection galleries um, surround this space. And it's kind of like a pause space, I think. I, it also reminds me very much of Oquian uh Venice Biennale, uh, I think it was 2015, uh, in which he devoted the entire center space of that exhibition to being a pause space, to being a space for performance, a space for readings and lectures. And this is what we deal with on a constant basis. Um, another uh, beautiful view. Um, Hugh Locke, for those in Pearl on the Sea, one of the most symbolic, I think, pieces uh, in the collection. And this work was up when the museum opened in December of 2013. And of course, we've had it up for uh, a couple of years um, after that as well. Um, not up right now, but uh, always, always in our minds. Um, Hugh Locke dealing not only with the, the, the sea and, and, and the direct relationship to our immediate outdoor space, but obviously the many metaphorical histories and directly speaking of for those in peril on the sea and what that means in terms of transatlantic history. Um, one of the first exhibitions, uh, or the first exhibition uh, as the museum opened in December of 2013 at Weiwei. Amelia Pelayas, who, who you saw a piece earlier, I mean, this is one of those hallmarks of, of, of Cuban art and of uh, tradition uh, for the museum over the course of time and somebody who is very important to our collection. Um, great show by Rene Morales. Um, Edward Duval Carrier, who I think like, likewise is an incredibly influential voice in the city right now and has been a mentor to so many uh, younger artists. Um, very early uh, exhibition. 
And I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna jump through some of these so we can get to what the current installations are. Fairly by Yes. Uh, Nari Ward, um, 2015. Um, and he, I think I, you can see the, the spirit of, of what I mentioned in terms of our context and how we go about um, presenting uh, artists. Doris Salcedo, the great Colombian artist, um, tough show, quiet show, very beautiful minimalist exhibition. These pieces of furniture are full with uh, cement. Um, very elegiac, very uh, kind of um, emotive installation. Um, Basquiat and the Notebooks, which was at the Brooklyn Museum, which in my opinion, you know, we had to have. Um, so that was a show that we squeezed into what you can see as a short exhibition period. And in post COVID times, we will probably never do an exhibition of that size for that short duration of a time but um, one of the, I think, most special uh, exhibitions for a lot of people, uh, thus just showing that. Um, we also included a room of works that live here in Miami, at least some of them. Um, there are more than a few and we're still waiting for those collectors to, to uh, donate them to us. Um, Julio Le Park, uh, and again, visit, revisiting um, football and contemporary art, uh, I, I, it will never get old for me. And it, different works um, within different contexts, but uh, always trying to uh, feel through um, some of the, the many, many, many different ways in which this works. And not showing video here, but this is Stephen Dean, one, an absolutely phenomenal piece that he filmed with small cameras throughout the stadiums of Brazil. And so you have this, this, this kind of ritualistic chanting. It almost sounds ritualistic. It's part of the fans at the game. And God, I can't believe I'm uh, looking at these images now in the context of all of the empty stadiums is, is, is weird. Um, uh, in the foreground, um, a work by Lyndon Barwa, uh, an um, amazing piece that, that, that he has worked in animation in Hollywood and all of these figurines uh, are playing out uh, theatrically in a video that he created to go along with the um, wonderful um, sculptural element. Um, a couple other images from that exhibition, which I worked on with Jennifer Inacio, one of our, our great curators. And of course, I mean, Leroy Sané came to the exhibition, so I have to have a picture of that. Um, incredible footballer for German national team and now Bayern Munich, but at the time was on Manchester City. Um, and Brandy Chastain, who is the, 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 the cream of the crop of, of American football. Um, community, obviously important to this conversation, but I am going to speed through that so we can talk about it a little bit more. And of just a view of the permanent collection galleries. Um, this, this is the gift of art from a couple of years ago. We celebrated our 35th anniversary. Sounds older, but in the context, of course, of museums, it's a very, very short period of time, especially one that's only been collecting since 94. Um, uh, uh, this is a room that has, has kind of stayed with the, this kind of aesthetic idea of, of the monochromatic and the geometric and the minimal. Uh, Anish Kapoor in the back and Solowit on the floor, but Carmen Herrera on the right. Um, there's a similar uh, thing happening now. Uh, Zilia Sanchez, of course. Um, um, one place, a couple of places, as I mentioned, with photography, there's a great deal of depth. With Cuban art, we have one of the biggest contemporary collections of Cuban art there is. Um, there also is an interesting uh, kind of group of works around the Washington Color School. Um, Gilliam, Sam Gilliam on the left, or, or, or 2001 work, so you know, not so recent, but not so old. Gene Davis in the middle, and Ken Nolan on the right. Uh, and then and a wonderful, wonderful uh, Sam Gilliam from 1970, which is elsewhere in the same room and up right now. Um, that Lewis in the context of, of Gilliam. Um, great Faith Ringgold in the back over there. Um, uh, Duchamp in the foreground. With Fredo Lam, who I, I don't know, I call our, our Picasso um, on the left. 
and Roberto Mata in the back over there, better view of those. Elias again. Um, let's go. And, and now we reopened November 5 uh, with this exhibition, Allied with Power. And, you know, in the, obviously in the context of, of, of Black Lives Matter, in the context of this past year, uh, I think a pretty prescient exhibition, but one we had been working on for quite some time. And Marielena Ortiz put this one together um, based off of, of selections from a recent gift uh, from the collection of George Perez. Um, and you see a variety of works here from uh, an entryway that includes a big triptych by Kara Walker, um, Finelli Moholy, two large wall print photographs, um, Robin Rhoda from South Africa, Yinka Shonabari, uh, Jonathan Andrades, who did this, this um, singular room piece, um, Christopher Myers, uh, it goes on. and My Body, My Rules, which I mentioned. Um, you know, the um, Lorna Simpson being also being important in the collection and that there are three uh, different works um, from not uh, from the 80s, 90s and 2000s actually. So you see a small diptych there and a room of, of, of salon style hang of photography that includes Mickey Thomas at the center. Um, Charlie Schneeman, Sandy Sherman, and others. A great Wangeshi Mutsu in the back next to the photographs of Anna Mendieta. And, and Polyphonic, um, we mentioned the Fund for African American Art, and I, I, maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Super um, um, happy uh, about that as we just did a big celebration a week and a half ago. And this is an installation I had been on before um, open just before closure. We closed March 16, reopened November 5th. Uh, but Ed Clark here, Romare Bearden, Teresa Cromati, Shabalala Self, there's a big grid of Lorraine O'Grady um, from her wonderful work, Art Is, uh, Nari Ward, and let's see. And, and let's, let's end there. Um, this outdoor piece, Jesus Rafael Soto, is a hallmark and symbol of the collection and of the building, um, which of course has been off limits uh, for now, but is one of those pieces that has just been so special to have on campus. Um, and, and I always feel like, yeah, I end with that slide because it's really like, what do people do within the space of the museum? Um, what does the art do? And so I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so sure. much, Franklin. Uh, I, I, I hope that you can hear the resounding applause um, we all applaud you for that fantastic presentation and just making us feel, I think, really connected and connected not only to you and your work and your leadership at PAM, but also to Miami and the art ecosystem there. Um, I've uh, obviously been to PAM and, and I felt as if when you were taking us through the galleries um, and through your various exhibitions of the permanent collection of photography, um, and the recent exhibitions that you put on that, that it was almost like being actually in the space itself. Um, I wanted to say to our, our wonderful audience who's gathered, uh, please feel free to share questions for Mr. Sermons um, in the Q&A. Um, and you know, as your questions come in, uh, uh, Franklin and I will have a little bit of a conversation because I, I have always have lots of questions. Um, you know, but I think one of the things that I wanted to share is that, you know, as, as I'll recall, and I know um, our, our team will recall and maybe our students as well, but, you know, just before uh, we, were, we, we were all sent home, we were actually planning to visit you. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the features of our program um, is field study. Um, and, and in our conversation with you earlier today, uh, yeah. you really reinforced how important it is um, for, for students to uh, develop networks really, really early on. Um, that when you do an exhibition, it's not just the curator's one singular vision, rather, it's always gonna be teamwork. Um, you gave us some really great examples of the kind of teamwork that you've been known for. And we were meant to travel uh, to see the joiner Drafida uh, collection yeah. on view and um, you know, we're not able to because of, of COVID. But I think I wanted to maybe begin with a question. Um, 
that has been a thread throughout your talk, and it's about the, you know, the art ecosystem in, in Miami. Um, and I really love, you know, going down memory lane, um, looking at, you know, those really, really, you know, seemingly very old uh, news clips, um, mm -hmm. you know, looking at, at the wor work, um, you know, of, you know, wrapping of the islands. Um, but I, I'm really interested too in, you know, what's the role of something like Art Basel Miami, you know, play now um, in the art ecosystem um, in Miami and, you know, the way, you know, as you talk about, um, you know, Miami and the Perez itself being the center, you know, of, you know, an art world, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you could maybe say something about that and mm -hmm. another question too about the community engagement that you're doing. I know you breezed through the slides, but you gave us a sample of some of the really important work you're doing with community engagement as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Cheryl, so good to, to be in conversation with you and so much admiration for all you do. I can't believe we've, we've had the opportunity to engage over the course of many years now, um, but great to have this chance. Um, our Basel changed a lot. It changes um, a lot as far as what the relationship is to a much more uh, international or global conversation. Not, you know, it's like, not that... Um, there weren't great things happening because you see that, right? You see these massive monumental sculptures or you see the fact that Christo, and when Christo and Jean-Claude came to do that project, that was at the time that they were being told no by New York City. Um, they already had the proposal for the gates. And of course that then hasn't happened for many, many, many years. But to them, they said, this is our, this is, this is Miami Central Park. The water is Miami Central Park. This is where people play. Um, so all of these things were happening and there is this, this incredible, that's the thing that I love about being here is that there is this incredible background in history that often is not discussed. To many people, we still don't exist except for the first week of December, which is when our Basel happens. Um, but there has been a, I think an incredible um, synergy uh, between the fair and all of the, insta all of the institutions. And it has given all of us a, an incredible um, platform. Um, and I'm reminded of that even in an especially difficult year for them this past year, we still had activities. We still did things under uh, the rubric of what we call Art Week. And Art Basel has been a huge part of that. It also served as a means of bringing people into a conversation with, I think what is a hallmark also of Miami and art, contemporary art in Miami is that per capita, we probably have more privately owned art spaces than any other place. I mean, if you think about the size of this place and then you think about the number of privately owned quite special collections that are here, um, it makes it really interesting. It also makes it a place where you don't have this perhaps the same level of civic community or camaraderie um, that you might uh, imagine in other places where there's only one museum. But it sure is interesting though. And you know, most of those people have been a part of our puzzle. Right, and I was gonna say, I mean, I think it's really, it's interesting like when you think about, um, and, and I don't wanna harp on this too long and I know mm -hmm. I kind of started out with the question about our puzzle, but if you look at the, history of the franchise, you know, beginning in Basel and this, this, you know, issue of, of, you know, there being so many, um, at least especially in the, in the Miami art ecosystem, many of these private collections. So I'm thinking of like the Rubels and so on. And yeah. I remember when I first started coming to Miami, it was, you know, maybe part of something at the convention center, and then you would go on these private tours of the private collections, right? Yes. Because they were the they were the welcoming committee, and they were part of Art Basel. They were part of the founding um, groups that that helped bring Art Basel to Miami. Because of course they were already going to Switzerland every June right. to see the big international exhibition, and thought we have the perfect place for you to come and do this on American soil, and you get to see all of our collections as well in warm weather. It's, it's fascinating. Yes, I mean, there is that. There, there is that. And, and in December, specifically, um, there is that context, which, which plays out all the time. Mm -hmm. 
So, so community engagement, I, I wanted to ask if you could maybe elaborate on some of the images that you showed this evening to talk about some of the projects that you do, um, you know, at the museum, but that reach out not just to local communities in and around Miami, but also throughout the state of Florida, as well as the neighboring Caribbean, uh, the global south, um, and also across the diaspora. If you could talk about some of the, the programs as they relate even to the different um, generations that you know come in and out of the doors of, of your museum. Mm. I mean, I think that to me, that's the most interesting thing about the transitional aspect of, of working on exhibitions as a curator to working on exhibitions um, as a director too is that overview of uh, how, how do you make the work sing? How do you um, bring forward difficult or sometimes challenging ideas and make them palatable or even seductive to a wide audience? And, and I, that is our job. Um, uh, there are there are several um, ways in which we go about that. We have this amazing um, new kind of celebration uh, called Kids Jam, which is obviously specifically at that age group, and it's all about art making. It's all about that physical kind of activity that is so much a part of one being comfortable with one's body at a very early age, being comfortable with the ways in which they move about the world. Um, so there's that, and then there are. Um, I take so much solace from our docents, which are also connected to our education program, which a lot of them give us a, a, an intergenerational nature um, that is part and parcel of the museum, right? So if you have uh, people who are presenting the work from, from, from every age group, then it makes it, I think there's a touch point for everyone to find themselves or to find a way in. Uh, one particularly vibrant program, I think, especially in light of the last year, has been our program, uh, Art Detectives, which is a collaboration with the Lynx Incorporated and the Miami-Dade County Police Department and Breakthrough Miami, um, which is a, an organization that is about uh, helping uh, elevate um, kids uh, academically and socially. And so to put them in difficult places, and I think a lot of your audience will know the video work of Arthur Jaffa, um, love is the message, the message is death, right? And it's what, eight minutes of just sheer history of Black people. And it is a tough piece to watch at times. It makes you cry, it makes you really angry. And to have kids looking at that piece with um, police officers, um, you know, is, 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 I, it's, it's just a great um, way of trying to find a way to make difficult conversation palatable. And, and I just believe art is the catalyst for those kinds of challenging conversations. Um, a great building helps, but the art has to push us uh, in order to do that. And, and our educators are the ones that tend to make those things palatable um, all the time. Absolutely, absolutely. So I want to um, just ask a couple of questions that our, our guests have posed uh, to you. Um, one, the first one comes from Destiny Fillmore, who is a graduating senior, um, an art history major, um, and also a native of uh, Tampa, Florida. Hope you don't mind me sharing that, Destiny. Um, and she asks you, if you could please speak about how the Perez is supporting Floridian artists throughout the peninsula and de destigmatizing, quote unquote, Florida art. Mm. Um, you know, I think what we try to do is we're we are a place that is concerned, as I mentioned, with international, modern, and contemporary art. And one of the ways that we function is to elevate the art around us, hopefully, you know, into conversations that are that are that are perhaps bigger than just Florida. Right, so what I think you'll see when you come through the galleries is you're always going to see Miami artists, and I should say Miami and South Florida because we have a particularly strong resonance there. Um, we do okay with Florida, we probably could do better, um, but we do really well with South Florida. Uh, and so if you're gonna talk about any, any uh, issue, that there should be some sort of reference point to, to the local, 
And that's what we're trying to do. In some ways, we're trying to do that in, in everything. Like I, I show the gallery of abstract and more monochromatic works um, because we do have that up right now. And opposite that is a gallery of almost all figurative um, representational painting. And what we're trying to do is change the, the, the canon on both sides, right? So you can go to any museum in the world and see the Solowit cube on the floor, or et cetera, or, or Nish Kapoor for that matter, right? But you're not gonna see it in the context of Zilia Sanchez, Carmen Herrera, Lolo Soldovia, three Cuban women artists that make it interesting from our point of view, or Sarah Modiano, Colombian uh, woman. Um, so we do that there and we do that on the other side. I think if you walk into a gallery right now, it's Kahende Wiley, Firale Baez, Andrew Decca, Akineli Crosby, Jeff Sunhouse, Irvin Anderson, and, and Lynette Boake. So trying to give some sort of a different picture that resonates for here. And the only way that we can do that, I say all this because it's an extension of being keyed into where we're from. And that means not just Miami and South Florida, but also we represent Florida. And you also have to mention within that context, um, big shout out to our dear friend, uh, Dr. Andrea Barnwell, who is the new director of the Commer Museum. So I know we have some North South things that are gonna be happening between Jacksonville and Miami shortly. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Franklin. Um, I mean, what a rich answer and, you know, definite shout out to Dr. Barnwell Brownlee. Um, and, and also just thinking about, you know, when, when you, you talk about looking at works of art in, you know, in relationship to other works of art, the juxtaposition, it makes a difference. Um, it makes a difference as to where you are in the world. It makes a difference as to where you are in the museum. And, and these kinds of uh, comparisons, if you will, really help us to see differently. They help us to see and learn Absolutely. so differently, see those works of art and those histories of art and the communities that they represent uh, really differently from different perspectives. Um, there's another question um, from Dominique Zafino. Um, that also asks a question sort of about, um, you know, audiences and regions, if you will. And he, uh, Dominique says, uh, per your lecture, uh, the Perez Art Museum, Miami, seems to have a large collection relating to Latin American and African, African artists catering to the demographics and culture of the city. Is regionalism something the museum considers to be a necessity moving forward? And is it something all museums should consider to strive for? I don't know if I would call it regionalism. Thank you for the question. I don't know if I would call it regionalism so much as, as representing where you come from. And, and I think that nobody can do that better than us. Like if we didn't have the best contemporary Cuban collection, then there would be something wrong. Like it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and it kind of goes out in concentric circles from there. So we want to we, we, we want to talk from this point of view. Um, and, and that also allows me to reminds me that, you know, we started a Caribbean cultural institute in the last year. Um, Maria Elena Ortiz and Iberia Perez are, are, are running that. And thanks to the Mellon Foundation, you know, we were able to do that. But we see ourselves as a node within a larger conversation. And we know we're not, you know, we didn't originate the discussion, but we think we can be great collaborators within the discussion. And so we've been in Bahamas, we've been in Jamaica, we've, you know, you, you saw the Henry Ward show, but we've also done other, many other artists from Jamaica, Ebony Patterson, um, John Dunkley, who has an Atlanta collection, uh, connection, Viatina. Um, you know, so there's this, there's this reference point that is ours and that we are proud of. And I think it allows for us to offer something to the world that is not only unique, but is special. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the way that I look at it. But we are, you know, we're here for that international community that travels the world going to fairs or used to um, every December, but we're also here for anybody every single day of the year beyond that. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Franklin. So the next question is one um, that I'm really, I'm so happy was posed. And, and I don't know, for me, for some reason, it seems to come somewhat out of left field, but it's close to something that um, I'm very interested, interested in um, and have been working on uh, with my class this semester, the curatorial practicum, uh, but also um, 
with the Art and Antiquities Blockchain Consortium headed uh, by Susan Damon Neal. And we're looking at, um, at least in January, we were um, hosting a January salon on blockchain and cultural heritage. And so the question um, that is posed, this is by Black Collectors Gallery is, Franklin, what would you say to museums, galleries, historical spaces, as we prepare for the uptick of blockchain and NFT tokenized art that is living in the digital world, i.e. Christie's historical move to take their coming purchases solely uh, to digital purchase, purchase, I think. I think that's what that says. Wow. Um, what's funny, my, my wife and I were having a conversation this morning about, um, about uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin and I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but, but I, 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 underlying the question is, is how does one move with innovation and how does one uh, move with technology, which is something that all museums have tried to do over the course of time um, from the very, very, very beginning, every little space, every little change along the way. And so we have a robust kind of program around at least an exploration of the digital and of new technology as it relates to art making, as it relates to culture. Um, I, I, I think we've been, we've been fortunate in that. We also have the Knight Foundation here in Miami that has been particularly um, progressive in that regard. Um, and, I, and, and I think there's an interesting analogy in that because the Knight Foundation grew out of the Knight Ritter uh, newspapers and they, let's just say they, an ominous they, witnessed firsthand what happened in the newspaper industry when people didn't pivot quickly enough to adapt to digital technology. Um, it, it's just, and they don't want that to happen to us in museums, and I don't want that to happen to us. So what, what we talk about a lot amongst curators, amongst educators, is how can we take risks, how can we take chances, and things we really don't actually know what, what, what the outcome is yet, or what it even looks like yet, which is why I begin by saying that I don't really know, I can't tell you about Bitcoin. Um, and I couldn't tell you about AR three years ago, but we did a project anyway. Um, one of the first museum projects is, was, was an AR, one of the first AR projects was a project we did with an artist here um, that eventually migrated not only from our space in the museum, but also to Miami International Airport where there was a presence there. And so we're trying, you know, you, can, you just, you have to, you have to move with it. And part of that is, is just part and parcel of, of being a institution dedicated to not only contemporary art, but to contemporary life. Right, and also to, to the future. And one of the, the hallmarks of our, our program is, excuse me, is to make sure that in every class that we teach that technology is a really, really big part of it. Um, mm. We have an innovation lab at, at Spelman and, um, you know, thinking about technology is one of the reasons why we did the salon on blockchain and cultural heritage to really look at how, for example, in um, museum registrarial practices, uh, blockchain technology might be something um, that oh could really gosh. transform um, collections management systems. I need uh, to sit in on that. So, so another question we have is from Synthony Sumter. Uh, and the question is, what factors were most influential in the direction you took the museum? Well, I think in a, in a cliche sense, if it, if it doesn't come through, in a cliche sense, I feel like museums are that last bastion. They're the place where, you know, if we can't come together in the context of a museum, which sometimes we can't, um, then, then, then we're hopeless in some ways. Um, you know, it, it's one of the few spaces where art should be able to move us forward in, in, in ways that are uh, uh, at least filled with empathy to some degree. Um, so there is this, this overall cliched kind of sense of art can change the world. Yes, um, museums are a part of changing the world. And so that's what, what, what drives me in that context. 
Um, what was the other part of the question? Sorry. Uh, the question, uh, the the inf what what factors were most influential in the direction you you took the museum? So thinking yes. about this, you know, this way forward and how you're revisioning um, yes. Miami's art museum. So with that in mind, the the thing is, you know, we happen to have that weird history. Um, we happen to have begun as a museum in in a difficult and challenging moment in which people did not see each other fully or wholly. Not that they do now, but there was an incredibly, um, it was a difficult time. I mean, there's a, there's a recent book called um, a, year of, a Year of Dangerous Living or something like that by Nicholas Griffin. And it, it documents the year, right? So this is 1983. What happens in 1983, the Mario Boatlift or is it 81? But so Mario Boat that happens at exactly this, it's exactly the same time that the officers are acquitted in the murder of Arthur McDuffie, um, which happened just a couple of miles away from our museum. Um, that happens in exactly the same moment. Can you imagine the tension of that time and which leads to lots of violence, um, lots of rebellions, and, and we haven't necessarily recovered from that in many ways. There's a great future and all that and it's a wonderful present, but, but there are things like that that have made a, such a profound impact upon the moment here and the institution. And this is a place and time for us to capitalize on that. So this year only made it more resonant to what we were already trying to do, which was recognize that we want our cake and eat it too a little bit, which is we want to be community centered. We want to be a place where people can come and, and, and do everything but fight, right? Like have an argument, have a challenging conversation um, and, and then learn to see each other a little bit better. Uh, so that's, that's the driving kind of force. Great, that's a great, that's a great way to think about, you know, that, that future, you know, this big bright future for, for, for all of us. Um, yeah, I mean, and that's part of our background. Like, like for me, you know, being going to a place like Student Museum in Harlem, growing up in that context, that's what that was about to me. It was about community. It was about tough conversation, but it was it's a very um, not utopic at all by any means, but one that is optimistic. Right, right. And it's also it's a nurturing community, right? Nurturing. You talked about, you know, your connection to people like Ed Clark and others who really, I think, nurtured you, mentored you at, at a very early, early age when you might not have really thought that this is what you might might do for your career. Absolutely. Um, so we have another question from Kavita who asks, does Pam or other popular, or do Pam or other popular American curators explore artists from Asia, specifically from Southeast Asia? Um, and how easy is it to get connected with artists and galleries from Asia? Yeah, I mean, the, I think one of the most interesting things about coming into, you know, this, this conversation on an international or global um, art conversation is that, we are a part of, of, of a network of, of, of people um, who are who have access to each other and access to different parts of the globe in many, many different ways. Um, we are part of different organizations, um, you know, like, like uh, International Curators Association, ICA. Um, we also are part of ICOM, and, which is another international organization. Um, so th there is this opportunity. And obviously, for me, that was important. I left New York in 1996 to live in Italy uh, for two years um, at a time when it allowed for me to like, you know, take the train to the Venice Biennial and to the Documenta and to the sculpture project in Munster. And then to be able to go straight down to South Africa in 1997 when the Biennial happened. Um, those, kind of, those kind of things uh, create a, a smaller, perhaps more, more connected world and experience. So yes, there are, there are many access points um, if one seeks them out. Great, great. So, so there's another question here um, from Felicia Randolph who asks, how has the COVID pandemic impacted attendance 
and your decisions about exhibitions and the future? Wow, yeah, great question. Um, so we opened, as I mentioned, November 5th. One thing I didn't show that I probably should have visually is that you know there are visual markers on the floor now. There are large video screens that are deployed in different parts of the museum now in a much more concentrated way, not only reminding us to be socially distant and to keep our masks on, but to be uh, aware of, of, of other factors and of other exhibitions or, or programs that are happening. So they perform a function, um, but it's a different route too. When you come in the museum now, you must take a, a route that we have prescribed. Uh, you must exit through this way. And so we've done a lot of things to make it a safe and healthy environment, first and foremost. That also means that, you know, we could do 50% of capacity. I don't think we're, we're not there yet, but we have instituted time ticketing, which most importantly also creates that kind of social distancing that is important for now. And we'll see how things evolve. And that's the toughest part about the job at the moment is that we just don't know, none of us do. Uh, we know things are getting better, but it, it goes like this. Um, I don't know how much it how it comes into play specifically on future exhibitions, uh, but it certainly has played a role. We lost not only the Joyner Jafrida exhibition, which should have been seen uh, in parallel to the exhibition Allied with Power right now. You know, you would have had a deep um, dive into modernism via African American art, particularly with the Joyner Jafrida collection, and then you would have had the complement of the more diasporic view that is part of Allied with Power it would have been amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is we were supposed to have uh, the Basquiat show that, that I know not enough people have seen in Boston at the MFA. Um, so it has affected our schedule in those kind of ways. Now, how does it conceptually affect the way that we make exhibitions in the future? I'm not totally sure, but we're running into this, to, to the issues. Um, doing a small exhibition with Marco Brambilla in, this summer. And originally you might've just gone to the show and everybody would put on some goggles and see this amazing 3D thing, like going around, you know, like total virtual um, experience, a VR experience. But the idea of sharing goggles now is just not gonna work. So we've developed a, a kind of sculptural uh, screen in order to show the work. Um, beyond that, we shall see the next two exhibitions in our larger space for next year, because we have paused a little bit until next year. We'll keep Allied with Power up for quite some time. And then we'll have Andy Warhol and Marisol, followed by Leandro Ehrlich. Uh, so we'll see. Fantastic. Thank you. That's such a rich answer to a, a really difficult question that, you know, many Great of us question. are really trying to still, you know, uh, be able to read the tea leaves and figure the future. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, I, I'm going to end, I, I have one more, I kind of have two more questions sure. for you. Um, you. <laughs> more about to, you know, be, be at, at time. And I, I also want to um, acknowledge a question from one of our, our newest uh, art history um, majors and curatorial studies minors. But before I do, I wanted to ask if you could just say something more um, about the pause space. And, and you know, I want to thank you for um, acknowledging the, the late great um, Oak William Wazer and, and the most amazing, you know, Venice Biennale in 2015, all the world's futures that he curated with that, you know, that space that was so, you know, nice. incredibly generative and energetic all the time, uh, performative um, and different, you know, in, in consideration. But if you could say something about the pause space and, and, and if you're able to actually utilize that space now um, that you're open yeah. given the, you know, the world that we live in. Yeah, and we can mention that we all probably should be at the new museum tonight because grief and, is it grief and grievance? Mm -hmm. um, Oakley's uh, last, I guess, last conceived exhibition is opening at the new museum. Um, the pause space for me also comes from a lot of thinking around the Manil collection in particular. Um, and it's a quite uh, unique space in that we don't, we do the opposite of what we do at PAM. Like at PAM, we try to 
give a lot of apparatus, I think, to the work, you know, like there are not only text labels, but um, we often program that what we call a pause space with a video that's playing a huge screen, right, 20 foot screen, whatever, playing at all times. Um, so people will sit down and learn something more about the artist whose work they might have just engaged with in an exhibition. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that right now. That that space is is completely closed off at the moment. But that thinking of, in order to fully digest something, you have to kind of pull back from it or get away from it for a moment. And, and I think that's where that, that idea comes from. So that space in our museum functions normally um, in that way, where it's just wonderful just to see people sit down and have a conversation and just whatever. You don't have to be looking at anything necessarily. And, and I, I love and where, it's, where it's located. It kind of reminds me of that spot on the High Line. You know? uh -huh. Yep. Yeah, the, yep. The theater where you kind of sit there and look up 10th Avenue or, yeah. Exactly. Um, and we don't, you know, especially in our world now with the amount of accessibility to screens that we all have, we barely pause ourselves, so. Right, right, we're gonna pause in about five minutes. Okay, this is a question from uh, Tanisha Carter Johnson, um, who I mentioned is uh, one of our newest art history uh, majors, curatorial studies minors. And she asks, how have your experiences in the art world and working with artists from a plethora of backgrounds aided in your insight and understanding of culture and society as a whole? Oh, uh, background translated into how that helps in some way. I mean, of course, you know, it does. Like, I think, you know, in the same way that, 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 that call and response thing is important to many of us. And, it is, and I mean, historically important, like genetically important. Mm -hmm. There are those kind of things, um, you know, I think coming from the point of view of where we go to one museum, we see none of us. And yet we know that there's this deep, crazy history, it's like, it's like it's so funny in the excitement and the, and, and sometimes the, I'm you know so happy for the many successes and there's never enough uh, as Thelma would say there's a never enough, um, but it's funny because like you know uh, there's so many artists that we've been talking about for so long. Um, I mean go and, and I can take it beyond us. I mean go read uh, Alain Locke or Arna Bontemp or or the crisis or W.E.B. Du Bois. I mean, there's a whole like history that people don't recognize. So to be able to walk in the room and know that you have kind of these trump cards in the back of your pocket. And I always felt that way, regardless of the fact of if it was the thing that was hot or receptive at the moment, we always knew that, gosh, we know this whole thing of, of history that hardly anybody in the room knows. Um, and so that, that has, I guess that has been quite um, helpful. Yeah, and, and it's, it's a special, special feeling, right? Um, so I, I think the last thing I'd like to ask you, Franklin, is just, you know, any pearls of wisdom, any advice for our students? Uh, one of the things that I, I didn't share in the very beginning, um, but uh, we will have our very first graduating class from the AUCR Collective this coming May, and we're really excited. We're so proud of our students and, and their accomplishments. And I just wanted to ask if you might um, share some pearls of wisdom. And we thank you again for spending this time with us this evening. I, I can only pick up off of where we were is that you, you know, know that you have a position, know that you have a place you've already done a tremendous amount of work to get to where you are and don't be afraid to share that knowledge no matter where you are. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Franklin Sermons, director of the Perez Art Museum Miami. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, AUC Art Collective team, Department of Art and Visual Culture team and faculty. Thank you, Spelman College, Morehouse College, Clark Atlanta University, and the Alice L. Walton Foundation. Have a good evening, all. And uh, the next time we can 
go somewhere, let's go visit Franklin in person at the Ferez Art Museum, Miami. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Good night, all. Good night.